Thank you for joining us this evening for our Juneteenth conversation in the spirit of liberation, Black presence, and futures. My name is Keandra Pryor, and I am the Mellon Initiative Project Manager at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Support for this program and Walters Art Museum is made possible through the combined generosity of individual donors, foundations, corporations, and grants from the City of Baltimore, the Maryland State Arts Council, citizens of Baltimore County, Howard County Government, and Howard County Arts Council. I have a few quick notes before we get started. Tonight's program is live, and we invite you to type your questions into the comment section of YouTube and Facebook. This program is being recorded and will be available on the museum's YouTube channel. So now onto our program. Tonight, I am truly honored to be joined by two people whose work intersect in the realm of radical imagination, forging space both within and without traditional institutions. Zoe Charlton is an artist and educator at American University, where she holds the title of professor in the Department of Art, which she chaired for several years. She is the first Black American tenured professor in the department. Her work has been collected and displayed across the country and the world. In collaboration with her colleague, Tim Dowd, she developed Syndicate, a collaborative artist initiative created to engage their overlapping creative research in gender, sexuality, race, and the economy of things. Her most recent work takes the form of large scale collages and drawings of women, a few of which we will have the honor of viewing tonight. Welcome, Zoe. Thank Dana, <laughs> sorry. Dana P. Moore Esquire is serving as Baltimore City's first Chief Equity Officer and Director of Baltimore's Office of Equity and Civil Rights. Appointed by Mayor Brandon M. Scott, Moore's mission is to establish frameworks within every city agency, board, and commission that will assure compliance with Baltimore's equity laws and mandates. This is not her only first. She was also the first woman in Baltimore's history to serve as the city's active, acting city solicitor and first woman deputy city solicitor. She has a long career as a lawyer, serving as a counsel, partner, and owning her own law firm. Welcome, Dana. <laughs> Dana? Yes. I would like to start with a quote you shared in our most recent conversations in preparation for tonight. It's from Ralph Ellison's novel, Juneteenth, which mm -hmm. was posthumously published in 1999. What do you think this quote says about Juneteenth and its current existence in the national consciousness? Um, so I, I imagine that Ralph Ellison was um, remarking, you know, without in, just in very few words, how hard it is uh, to have been uh, living in that time that most everyone had gotten word of the emancipation, but not those in Texas. They had to wait until, you know, the middle of June to of. Uh, you know, June 19 actually was the date to get the word. And there had been months of them continuing in enslavement before they learned that they were, quote, free. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he says the, the celebration of a gaudy illusion, um, it's, there, there's, we celebrate Juneteenth. We, we, it's a landmark. It's a date when, uh, you know, we learned that there was freedom and, you know, but it was also um, ironic that it was not until June 19th that that word got all the way down to Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, when you read the actual order uh, that was read by the general on June 19th, you know, it says, you know, in essence, you are free, but stay where you are, stay in place. Mm -hmm. You've just changed your roles to that of employer and employee. Keep working. Don't be idle. Don't um, really do anything different. And I, I think that uh, 
Ralph Ellison understood that as sort of, okay, really change. It's, it's why are we celebrating this thing that really didn't set us free? That's what I think. It's so fascinating um, that contradiction between um, captivity and, and freedom and how they coexist coexists within um, the Black experience in America. Um, and I, I told you both when we last spoke about my sort of obsession with this concept of the captive maternal, which I was introduced to by the scholar and philosopher Joy James. Um, she really reckons with this idea that's really familiar to us all, um, this, this figure whose existence is tied to caring for the very thing that oppresses you. And even though it has allowed me to reflect on my own position in institutions, it has done so much more to under, more for me to understand the letter that's on the screen, um, which was written by Sibby Grant, who was enslaved as a cook. And she sent this letter, which is now part of the Walters collection to her enslaver while he was imprisoned for his allegiance to the Confederacy. This letter was a topic of last year's Juneteenth discussion, if you wanna hear more about it. But in it, she says many things, but one thing that is striking is she says um, in slide four, whenever I cook a good dinner, I wish she was here to enjoy it. I done them in style for you know that no one can do them like I can. And as I said, her writing is so rich. Um, but here, I believe she demands recognition for her unique ability and agency to nourish and delight. However, this agency is bound to those whom she serves, those who also hold her in captivity. Here again, this dichotomy between freedom and captivity. And Joy James is brilliant in her ability to articulate those parallels not equality, but parallels between those who we are often told are at opposite ends of freedom. For instance, the incarcerated who are made to care for the buildings and grounds in which they are captive, and those of us who are seeking change within and sometimes abolition of the institutions that in our daily lives we uphold. So that was a big intro to a big question. <laughs> but how do you both reckon with your own care and criticisms of the institutions in which you work? Oh, Zoe, it looks like you're up first. <laughs> um, I appreciated uh, you reading that. I, I think the, the, the um, concept of the captive maternal is agreed with what you said. It's something that many of us experience. Um, I think about my own role um, in, in the institution in which I work and that at the same time that I am thinking and talking about liberatory practices, I am still an employee of the institution that sets um, uh, that that sets standards, right? That sets rules that um, uh, teaches in a particular way or has a particular philosophy. And so, how do I work around that? And I think that there's um, there's a great book, um, The Undercommons, by um, Fred and Stefano Harney, that actually talks about this very complicated space. They don't use the term, the capital internal, but it's really what they're talking, it's partially what they're talking about. And so how do you give critique to that which um, is part of your survival or your livelihood, right? Mm -hmm. And how much of that critique um, is tolerated? And I and I use the word tolerate, tolerate um, um, specifically is tolerated by that institution. And I think that, you know, folks that are in that position or in the position that I am, you start to learn the things that you can say and the things that you probably should not say, but you say it anyway. There's a certain amount of pushing back. <laughs> what I also think about 
about um, with all of that is the role that people who are um, ostensibly consumers mm -hmm. of the products that, you know, of those products like education, right? Mm. That, that they actually have a lot of space to be critical and still be a part of it in a way that sometimes people who are um, tied to the institution through employment may not always feel comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think about our, my own proximity to that and the people around me's proximity to that. Mm -hmm. When we um, are able to give voice to those things and how we give voice to those things that we don't agree with, when it's safe to do so. In incredible. Yes. The inside, outside. How does one agitate? And what are the tools that we each have within our different spaces of power um, and privilege and experience? Dana, do you want to talk a little bit about this at all? Sure. So, and I think um, for me, um, I don't know, freedom and the ability to move about. For me, a lot of it is what's, what's in your in your head and what you think and, and um, you, what you decide for yourself. I mean, right now I, um, I'm, you know, I'm employed by the city of Baltimore. I have a job now that has given me more opportunity to use my voice and my freedom of thought and expression mm -hmm. than any job that I have had since I became a lawyer. Um, I am the voice of pushing an agenda that I happen to embrace 1000%. So it, it's liberating. <laughs> it's mm. liberating for me to be in this job. And I have a sharp contrast. You know, as acting city solicitor, um, I represented the mayor and city council. Um, I didn't do policy. I was the lawyer and I was behind the scenes very much saying, this is what we can do. This is what we can't do. This is how we're going to navigate. You know, I was not a spokesperson whatsoever. I was absolutely, um, I was very constrained in, in what I said and what I did because um, I had the ability, you know, as city solicitor to bind the city to all manner of things. And I never wanted to wake up and read in the Baltimore Sun. Well, the city's lawyer said that we're going to be closing down all of these streets and, you know, that's a huge responsibility. So I felt very constrained. And in the job I have now, I do feel more freedom. Mm. But, um, in all of the, the um, you know, the constructs in which we, we live and we navigate, there, there's opportunity and there's elements that are completely freeing and there's some that are just, just not. Um, I guess when I think of, um, you know, and I was helping, you know, raise my granddaughter it really was the best time of, of my life. And I loved every, just every nanosecond of it. But um, I feel, you know, in hindsight, there was, there was a lot of freedom that I gave up in order to be able to be fully present, you know, with her. There were a lot of things I didn't do. Um, I did have the ability to choose not to do them. There were some things I really felt I needed to do, but I just couldn't do. Um, but I, I chose um, a different path. So you know, I don't know. I mean, we're, it's 2000, uh, you know, 21. Um, I think we've all evolved to a place where uh, and it's like what Zoe said, we know what we can say, we know what we can't <laughs> say. And we, you know, we, we were informed, we have the ability to choose on, on some of those things. Um, but um, I think, you know, in truth, this is probably the freest I have ever been in, in mm -hmm. work. <laughs> I, and it's that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can I say, I, you know, uh, I really appreciate what you just said, Dana. Um, it makes me think about the differences between, you know, what liberty or liberation is and freedom, right? And um, there's some uh, part of what you're, what I understood you're talking about is we do have, um, the freedom and we take that freedom to think the thoughts we have um there but there are 
uh, ways that that freedom is conditional. Mm. It's conditional. And then we have liberty or liberation. I'm sorry, I keep saying liberty, but I mean, you know, what does it mean to be liberated? And I think about liberation frequently or a lot all the time because I, I am um, searching for ways that my freedom can be attained. And mm -hmm. liberation, liberation is a very active process. Freedom is something that is there already. Uh, and I think like that's, it's, it was so, um, I just felt that it was very profound what you said. And so, um, yeah, thank you for opening up the distinction between the two of those. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm married. I, I hadn't been married for very long when uh, we were actually outside of the Walters uh, with a couple who had been married for a very, very long time. And they were talking about going from the Walters to go see a baseball game. And the wife said, I don't want to go. Huh. And I was like, oh. she actually said she doesn't want to go, you know, with her husband. I've never... I never heard that. And I was, well, that's novel. Where did that come from? And I said to her, I said, why did you say that? She goes, because I don't want to go. I'm not going. <laughs> it's like, well, talk about, I mean, it was, it was um, such a liberating moment for me that you could actually say, I don't want to do that. Uh, that you could be in this institution of marriage uh, where there's, you know, a lot of expectations and a lot of, you know, uh, framing around that. And, and for her to say, I just don't want to do it. And I'm not going <laughs> to, <laughs> that's the simple words. And it really uh, changed a lot of my thinking about, about choice and speaking out and, um, you know, navigating life in a way that makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't all have that. And I, I really love the Sibby Grant letter. And when I think of her, I think of her writing to her enslaver, right? He is, yeah. he owns her. <laughs> and Absolutely. she's writing about these lush meals that she wished that she could serve him. <laughs> it's in prison. <laughs> and, you know, I, I wonder what, 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 what was more strict restricting her state of enslavement or his imprisonment. And I think it's her state of enslavement, mm -hmm. even though she, she writes liberally. But anyway, mm -hmm. musings. I love this. So we've, we've set up um, a framework to think together through this um, conversation of the difference between freedom and liberation and how that process works as far as attaining liberation. Um, what is the process by which we get there? So I'd like love to, now turn to a really um, personal image um, for you, Zoe. Um, and we're gonna change the conversation slightly to talking about uh, land, belonging, and home. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, both of your practices reckon deeply with belonging, displacement, and home. Zoe, in your work uh, surrounding what you call uh, in this um, ubiquitous blue house, mm -hmm. which is, is a symbol that embodies memory, home, and as you put it, a community anchor. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about that um, as we look at your um, some pieces of yours. Mm -hmm. And Dana, in your work, it must be noted, of course, that Baltimore is the birthplace of redlining, ensuring equity in all things, including housing. housing. Um, what does it mean to belong? And how does belonging relate to this process of liberation? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I am happy to start um, this with this image. Um, this is a photo of my grandmother's house. It was the homestead. And as you uh, so correctly described, Kiandra, it, it was a community anchor, it was a family anchor. Um, my grandmother owned um, at one point, nine, 10, 11, 15 acres. Um, and by the time she passed away, she had four and a half or five. Mm -hmm. And 
the interesting thing is um, she had an opportunity to buy property in the 40s at a time when many folks were many black folks weren't purchasing property. And um, and she knew that owning land was going to be part of her liberation process, her self liberation, and that owning property would be the way that she could have the freedom to live in the way that she wanted, mm -hmm. even if it would meant just on that property. And she also recognized um, that, that doing so enabled the um, further liberation of everyone that came after her, that mm -hmm. became a symbol of what's possible, right? And, um, and family members, took her up on that. I think that this is this is such an important thing. And it's also important for me to say that my grandmother had no more than a third grade education and she was thinking in these ways. Hmm. And, um, which, um, and, and this is such a powerful thing for me to remember uh, as an educator myself, that, you know, there's kind of the book learning, the the, the book smarts and then it's, there's common sense, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a common sense. Um, and, um, and so, you know, this led to um, family members understanding what it meant to not just have roots, but to establish roots, mm. to be a part of the place where you are and to understand that we can make the places that we want to belong to you know, um, that's really powerful. Um, and that's a liberated mindset. So um, I, I just love this story about, you know, Zoe and, and her, her grandmother. And um, it's just a, such a powerful story of an African-American woman and you know, owning all of that land and and holding it, and and um, it it um, being a, a marker, a grounder for generations, you know, to come. And you know, my experience is very is very different. I um, and I shared. Um, my father was in the military. Both of my parents were from Topeka, Kansas. They had no no desire to stay in, in Kansas. <laughs> And you know, when you think about it, they were born in the 1930s. It was uh, obviously, you know, pre before the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education decision. And they wanted um, my father; all he ever wanted to do was fly, and my mother just wanted to be a good, a good, good wife. And uh, which, now that I'm talking about it, which is why I was so shocked when my friend said, "I'm not, I'm not going." I never heard my mother say that. She was. You know, every year, every other year, packing us up and going wherever my father wanted to or needed to go, wherever he was transferred. So rootedness is um, it's probably something that I I really lacked and missed in in my growing up. And it it was not until I moved to Baltimore in 1982 that I met people that lived in um, the same neighborhood as their their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents. That was a foreign concept to me. And, um, you know, in some ways you, you might think that it's more liberating and more freeing to be uh, that mobile and that, I mean, transient, you know, is, is probably the right word. We don't really think of that as military kids, but uh, we moved so much and it was always refreshing, you know, the whole process of finding friends, establishing friendships, holding on to them and then having to let them go. And, and I really developed, um, you know, the ability to okay make friends, but also letting them go and and not holding on. And I, I don't think that the 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 letting go is a that to me was not a freeing experience. <laughs> that was a hard thing. Um, so you know, fast forward to 1969, my parents moved to Washington D.C. My mother is in still in the house that my parents purchased in 1970, and that that. That's where you where I get the grounding. Um, my mother said that she's never going to leave that house, and, and we'll all gather there on Saturday to celebrate 
her 89th birthday. Yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, yeah, we're all fully vaccinated and, and um, you know, I just got the invitation a few hours ago. So, you know, I don't know. I feel um, just so many tensions about, you know, freedom and the ability to, um, to truly, you know, be free and, but wanting uh, to be grounded, not having it, uh, just an interesting thing, interesting part of, of my life. And I so identify, um, I wasn't a military, I wasn't in a military family. My mom just really took up opportunities a lot. And so I very much identify with the idea of having to let friendships go and move and how, you know, in, in some, in some ways it's freeing in that it's easy to meet new people <clears throat> and feel like a, a fish out of water, but also you lose a lot of those roots, right? Um, mm -hmm. And those connections through that process. Yeah. yeah. So um, I want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat um, for um, Dana, for um, for Zoe, or for myself. Um, and I will. We're gonna tran transition a little bit. Um, and we're going to start talking about a topic that, that came up um, in our last conversation, and that was about the idea of um, letting go of your bodily form and the freedom of abstraction. So, uh, Zoe, in that conversation, you reminded us that freedom is not something that most of us actually experience. Um, in fact, as Black women, our bodies sometimes restrict our access to freedom. So how has the abstract and stepping away from the body and the fig figural been used in your work as a medium of liberation? Well, that's a great question. I also just want to note to Dana, uh, when we were talking about this before, we both have military different yes. backgrounds. And so, yeah, yeah, um, yeah we, I feel very much uh, related to you, Dana. <laughs> um, Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> You know, I, I, my work heavily relies on representing bodies. It does. And so in that regard, I do not engage in levels of abstraction when I'm working in drawing or in collage. The body is always present. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want that body to be abstract. Now, it might be, it might look like an archetype. It might look like a kind of, you know, um, it might seem general, but these are very specific bodies of women. Um, these women that I'm, make, I'm drawing in my current series are larger women. They're women that are the size of my relatives, my aunts, and my grandmothers, and and uh, and their maternal bodies. However, in um, when I work sculpturally, I am engaging in levels of abstraction. Right, and and it's really important because I don't. It's not that I'm striving for something that is universal. I am striving for something or an image that is um, like plural, right? And it's like many people can come and find themselves in specifically uh, women of color, black women, women of a certain size. And that there is a relationship that these women that um, that I'm specifically talking to can find with the bodies and the objects that I'm making. And so abstraction, in the case of the um, house, is important. And I just got a message from someone that I am echoing, and I'm not sure why. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, but you know, for the house, because I wanted to be talking about other concerns like belonging and not necessarily the body. I am talking about, um, I'm talking about place and not specifically the body. And so this gives me room to do that when I am not working in figuration. I think somehow, Zoe, I was setting off your echo, so I'm just going to mute myself in between. I'm sorry. I don't know how I'm doing it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 
so uh, Dana, in your work, which in which the body is the written word or the law, your work requires that you, as you put it, knock down false narratives. When we talk about the abstract, we often don't think about law or legal practice, but law in a way is a work of abstraction in that it attempts to articulate in universal terms, rules that help us navigate the everyday needs of a functioning society. So how do you think this idea, this idea of abstraction serves you in your work in moving Baltimore towards equity? So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but what I will say is, is this, um, law as written is, is uh, it guides us, it, it sets our course, um, it tells us what we're supposed to do. And uh, you know, I have always um, been able to, and, and, and I think good lawyers do this. You look at the written word, you look at the law, um, you understand what it says, and then you have to make it fit for your client. <laughs> and you have to make it um, um, vocalize uh, what your clients need. So in terms of the work of equity, um, our laws have told us what is supposed to happen. Uh, and I just to bring it back to um, Juneteenth, we're all supposed to be free. The law said so. The law was, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in Jan on January 1, 1863. It wasn't until June 19, 1865, that this whole you know, group of, of people in Texas learned, well, hey, babe, it's been two and a half years since you, you know, this was done two and a half years ago. So, yeah, you know, took a little, little longer to get it to you. But um, so, you know, on the one hand, the law sets our course. It tells us, like I said, what is supposed to be. But if you don't know the law, if you don't know how to use it, it doesn't matter. So equity is um, our, our, my new mission, my new focus is um, using the law to achieve what has been promised. And when I talk about this talk, I, I, I sort of frame it as promises made and then question mark, you know, promises kept. Have we kept the promise that the law has said we're entitled to? And I think for many, 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 far too many people, and in far too many instances, the answer is no. Um, we really shouldn't be having to have conversations about equity, but uh, th there was a law that was passed that said it is legal to exclude black people and Jews. And, you know, we didn't have the term Latinx then, but, you know, foreign speaking people, it is okay to keep them out of Roland Park and Guilford and Homeland and so many neighborhoods um, across the city. Yeah, that's the law. We can do that. Um, and if that wasn't good enough, uh, there were laws that said, you know what, um, or redlining principles that said, and where they are, where, where you find the black folks, don't invest there. <laughs> that was okay. And so, I mean, that's pernicious, it's ugly, it's a, a terrible part of our history. Um, and it, for me, it in many ways relates back to the order that was read on June 19, 1865. You're free, but you're not. You're free, but stay where you are. You're free, but you keep working for the person who enslaved you. And fast forward to, you know, to the 1900s. You're free, but you can't live here. You're free, you can live where you are, but we're not gonna invest. We're not gonna give you the insurance that you need. We're not going to allow you to develop generational wealth. You're free, but there's so many things that you can't do. And so the law um, can help us, it can hurt us. And the job you know, that I have now is to understand how we can right the wrongs of wrong laws. <laughs> There were some really wrong laws. And thank you for your work. Um, it's so necessary. Um, 
So uh, we'll continue in, actually, I'm gonna jump to, go back to what Zoe brought up, which is that you both have this uh, military background. Um, and sorry, just reminding everyone who's tuning in that it's okay to ask questions um, and please do leave them in the chat. Um, you all both talk about uh, your upbringing um, and the impacts of your upbringing on your identity, specifically being raised in military families. Um, when I think about the military, I think about control and strict regimens, but how you all have both done so much to uh, transform your fields. So how do you think your upbringing has shaped your thinking on resistance and rebellion? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what to go first. I know. <laughs> I have no idea why I even laughed. Um, you know, um, what's really, my dad was in the Air Force for 26 years. Uh, to this day, I still wake up at 5 a.m. because of that. <laughs> um, and so uh, the, the, the interesting thing is my dad wanted me to go to the service because he, um, understood the military as a space of opportunity, and it because because it was for him. Um, for my dad, the military is what moved him from relative poverty into um, into spaces of aspiration. Right. Uh, it was also a, a way that he knew that he could provide family, his family, his um, uh, family that parts of the family that he left behind, and his family, my brother and I and my mom, stability. And it also gave um, gave him the ability to be mobile in a way that he would not have imagined, he could not have imagined himself to be. Now how that ends up translating to me is that I have grown up with these expectations of mobility, right? Um, I am a generation and a half removed from my mom and dad's experience living in segregation, right? My experience with um, particular isms, racism, um, are, are systemic, right? They are not the kind of direct racist or racisms that my parents lived through. And so it's important to recognize that. So the military under the um, kind of guise of democracy, democratic equality, um, uh, uh, afforded a different kind of lifestyle for me. Now, we all know, I, I think we all know, that the military is full of all the things that we see mirrored in the, that are happening in the world. We know that that happens. You know, we, saw the, we, we see evidence of the example of, you know, officers, black officers being stopped by the police and interrogated. So obviously the military and his position, his uniform did not uh, protect him from that. <clears throat> and I also know that the military is part of the reason why I am the person that I am right now. Yeah, um, I, I agree with everything that Zoe said. Um, so my father joined the Marine Corps at, I think he was 17 is when he, he, he joined. And so that was in the early or the late 1940s. And at the time that he joined, it was thought that um, the best that a, the Negro black man could be is someone that would cook or clean. And although he was free to join the Marine Corps, he was accepted. He was not free to achieve his dream. And he had to fight every step of the way to become a pilot. Um, he had to um, push and he had to change things. He was the first black person to become a pilot in the Marine Corps. And I think his drive and his, um, uh, oh no, you won't deny me. I think that's part of my DNA as well. And, but the other part is he tolerated a lot. Um, he was the black officer in uniform who was uh, arrested 
and accused of impersonating an officer. He is the black person who was in uniform who uh, in Alabama, when they crossed into a certain part of Alabama, was told, all right, you got, you got to get to the back of the bus because we're in this part now and you cannot be up front. Uh, he is the person who um, was uh, falsely accused, who was uh, downgraded, who was not um, given his, his props that he had earned. Uh, when he uh, eventually you know, retired, uh, he, was, he retired as a three-star general. He was the first black person to be a general in the Marine Corps of, of it, right. And it, it didn't happen uh, just because he put the time in. It happened because he did a lot of hard work. He took, took a lot of hard knocks and he suffered a lot. And he brought a lot of that home. Um, he uh, made sure that we were always dressed neatly, that our hair was always done that we were a certain way that we never, you know, as his kids, you know, gave a reason for negative scrutiny. Um, we were, you know, there was a drive to, to do better, to be better. Um, my father is the one that talked to me about, you know, girl, you need to go to law school. You, you just need to go to law school. As much as you argue at the breakfast table, you need to go to law school. So he's the one that put that idea in my head. And he was like, we need, we need strong people uh, to be good lawyers and to help in the civil rights fight, which I didn't do, but um, but kind of I'm doing it now. Um, so the the Marine Corps um, it 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 created a lot of opportunity. Obviously, um, there was a lot of uh, there were just a lot of challenges. Uh, we saw um, you know you know places we lived all over the country. Um, but I, I think it, uh, it, it's, again, I keep coming back to this theme of free but not free. Uh, and um, there was a lot of, uh, my father was very strict. Um, you know, I've told, uh, you know, friends, I didn't really, really get to know him until the end of his life when he was very sick. And I took... Um, basically a year and a half off of work just to, to, to be there, to, just to be there. And, um, you know, he said to me, you know, Dana, my first love is the Marine Corps. And I hope you understand that. I found that um, I wasn't sad by it. I knew it. I already knew it. I already knew that that was his truth. And, um, I appreciated that he felt comfortable saying it, you know, towards the end, he felt comfortable saying it. But anyway, it's, um, I don't know any other life, but except growing up as a Marine Corps kid. And, um, but I think it infused us with a lot of expectation, a lot of um, don't just take it. Don't, don't accept things as they are. You can change them. You, you, uh, you can you can go into a place, you can go into a system, and you can you can make it work for you. You you have to fight, but I've told you how to fight. So I love this. I'm just gonna say ditto to Dana. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think that way of that relationship with military service is generational too. I have um, younger male cousins and women, uh, female cousins who were in the service that actually don't have that same kind of um, loyalty to the military that my dad has mm. had. You know, um, so that's really yeah. Mm. yeah. My brother-in-law, uh, we call him Sarge, uh, John Moore. And he, he's, he was in the army. He's very, very, uh, that that's very much of, uh, of who he is. You know, he still wears the camel, you know, the green khakis and the camouflage, and and uh, it's really important to him that he's had that experience. And uh, I've got cousins who are in the military. My other brother-in-law, Alvin, was was also in the army, and there's a rigor that that comes with that experience and. Um, I think it's also knowing that you can survive no matter what someone puts on you, True. no matter how 
might they might try to oppress you you know how to survive in uh, the deepest darkest most oppressive places because your freedom is in your heart it's in your soul it's in your dna and you and you will not be oppressed you will not be held down but so long and um i see that in, in my both of my brother in laws and i certainly saw it in my father and uh my cousins as well. It's it's an amazing. It's a gift. <laughs> it's it's a gift to be able to you know be in a space and and still know in your head and your heart you're you're choosing freedom for yourself. There there also seems to be a thread of um, this 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 thread of them seeking. Uh, this partial maybe sacrifice in in work uh, in their labor and their dedication to the military that um, but part of that wish was was also to transfer liberate liberation and freedom to their descendants and to their children and to you which I think is is a really interesting thing and um, I, I find it so fascinating you know, reading your, both of your biographies and, you know, the first, like this idea of, of, of being the first in a space, creating new spaces and, and, you know, the parallels of your own life of probably being the only, the new family and, and, and creating those new spaces and, and, and new stories through your travels and movements um, growing up. And, um, I'm curious what you think um, about this idea of first and individual excellence. And um, I'm curious what you think um, the impact of being a first as you both are um, and, and that impact on our collective liberation, which is another uh, topic that came up in conversation. So I think, um being the first um, at, at anything, I'll just say for me, it, it means that, you know, maybe you had to, to work a little harder, you had to do a little more, you had to, you know, sacrifice a little to just to just to make it just to um, be thought worthy. I, I was the first African American to be a partner, African American woman to be a partner at the law firm at which I was a partner. And it was hard. It was really hard. And I was determined that I would not be the only. And um, it was, um, and I think that's, that, that's the, that is the responsibility of those of us who have been the first this, that, or the other, is to make sure that there's a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth. And I can say that that's happened at the law firm. Um, I'm not sure when the the, the city uh, will get another female deputy city solicitor, but I'll do everything I can to see that it happens. And it, and it, you know that that's important. Um, the the achieving the first um, title or the first this that or the other to me it's just a moment because once you achieve it, you have to. Um, deliver <laughs> on um, the expectation and the, the goals that you set for yourself. And it's a high bar, I think. So Zoe, what, what do you think? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dana. Um, it, is a, is, it is a challenging space to be the first. And it's also really exciting. Um, some of the things that I recognized uh, after understanding that I am the first black tenured professor in the Department of Art, is that um, I had to really pay attention to the things that people were saying that were um, not just general statements of um, criticism or praise, but how those um, I had to filter and understand those comments through lenses that were um, through the lens of unconscious biases, right? And actually point that out. And I recognize that uh, by pointing that out, it also put me um, into a antagonistic or adversarial role with some folks. Um, but one thing I do know 
is that the next people that came through, next black folks, folks of color, did not experience or experience less of that. And so I'm not saying that because it's um, a burden that I think the first is willing to bear, or has to bear, and it's not something to be glorified. It's just that um, I think that people who are non-Black um, go ahead and get all the things out that they need to say, because I actually don't want um, my students of color, particularly my Black students, to have to engage in those ways, to have to use mm -hmm. elbow to get somewhere. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm excited to, to announce that I have been um, promoted to full professor in my department. I'm really excited. Uh, I'm thrilled. That news came out like a few weeks ago, and now I can officially announce it. Um, thank you. I'm so thrilled. Um, and, you know, and with that comes, I understand a, a responsibility because I am looking at full professors, black women who are full professors across academia, and I don't see many. And right. two, I'm like, who are you? Or I am, you know, standing them from afar, you know? So, you know, and I'm following that example. And I want to be an example of what's possible, right? Even what's possible um, if, um, if you're, um, you understand your role to be a disruptor, Maybe, you know, um, you know, I I think I take on a lot of roles at my institution, um, and so, you know, that that, and I also think that being a first means that um, means for me that I have to express what it means to live in my joy, my joy, and and how I relish my my uh, my ability to do things. You know my willingness to do things and to say that you know being a first has a lot of happiness in, in that you know i have experienced a lot of joy and pleasure um in this and being able to um share that with my communities around me so yeah congratulations yes congratulations Thank you. <laughs> That is awesome, Zoe. Patch right now. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> so we have one question from the audience, um, and it's from Allison. Allison asks, uh, being the first and paving the way for the next generation sounds very rewarding, but very exhausting. How do you both practice self-care and stay energized for the struggle of moving things forward? Wow. Um, uh oh, I think Dana might be frozen. Oh no, <laughs> come back. Um, but I can I can start off the answer. Um, you know, self care is. Wow, <laughs> I like to say, how do you spell that? And it should be M E. <laughs> you know, how do you do that? Um, you know, I've had to just in terms of a schedule, I've had to limit the amount of time that I spend out doing things. I've had to make sure that the um, activities that I'm doing are pushing uh, my my values forward. Um, and it, that was a hard thing to do, because I think in my in my role, especially when I was junior faculty, I was always just doing, doing, doing. And I was doing uh, more, more, more than perhaps other people around me were doing. And, um, but the more that I was in that, my position, my role, the more I had to start saying, actually, this is not serving me. I experienced significant burnout um, at my job. I experienced um, uh, that invited, um, that invited microaggressions, you know, um, because people thought that I would do things or I, they could say things. And so my self care, um, I remember when I was chair was to be off every Monday and to be away from the office every Thursday, but available. And so I had to set up these parameters around my availability. 
And that actually helped me understand um, a, uh, what I needed for my own self-care. Also, self-care for me has been about investing in different communities and in different politics. A dear friend, Rob Farrell, um, gives talks. He, he runs, he's the senior organizer for Organizing Black in Baltimore. And, um, and he always made this statement, find your political home. And, uh, you know, and I always thought that that was so great. And I thought, well, what does that mean? What if you have, you can't identify your politic? Well, you need to find a home somewhere. And so my home became the different communities that I felt the safest in, right? And so I started investing more and more time in those particular communities. And I will tell you that they're not all art communities. And, um, and that was really exciting because it gave me it, it's providing me with um, with um, affirmation and confirmation and challenging and challenging my own values, and you know, and two of those homes, political homes, if you will, um, are you know the blacksmiths and the circuit, and those have been uh, very important to me putting um, values into action. Right, especially in the space of academia. Wow, yeah. So Dana, we were talking about um, self-care, yeah. How do you, I mean, today, Dana is joining us after a really intense day-long conference, hopped right back into the office, got, you know, and, and, you know, as I was reading your bio, I'm just like, oh, my God. Like, I was feeling the weight of the responsibility of your position. I mean, not only is it new, but you're overseeing literally the entire city and how they will um, be more equitable. And that sounds, that should not sound easy, right? It, it might be a small word, but it is a very big task. And so how do you create those boundaries so that you can you know, protect yourself and, and ensure that we have many, 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 many more years uh, enjoying your service. So, I'm, uh, first of all, thank you. That, that You make me sound a lot more important than I am. More important. <laughs> but, but no less tired than I actually am. Um, so I have learned how to say no that there's just just some things that that are not for me that I you know I, I don't have anything to add I I, I can't do it. Um, it it's not within my my lane which is really weird for me to say oh no that's not for me um, and um, I have uh, joined I guess I started in uh, March or April of last year a walking group we uh, we call ourselves Chauncey's Angels because Chauncey is our our personal trainer. And we walk every Sunday through Druid Hill Park. Uh, we go through the hills and it's grueling. We go anywhere from four to 10. Sometimes we've done 15 miles in a, in a day. And I tend to be at the pack, back of the pack for two reasons. One, I've got short legs. I'm slow. I, I do the best I can. But it is also very meditative for me. And being together with my friends and being together with the group, but also alone is, um, I, I have just found that just, just refreshing. Um, people who know me know that one of my absolute favorite humans in the whole wide world is Selena Camille Christian. And that is my 14 year old granddaughter. Um, believe it or not, one of my favorite times of the day I, I have two. It's when I pick her up to take her to school and we have our conversations. And then when I pick her up at the end of the day and invariably we will go and, you know, get a snack. It's grandma. Can, I, can you need a snack, grandma? Which is French for grandma. I need a snack. Uh, but, but I get great joy just uh, being with her and talking with her and listening to her and her 14-year-old successes and her 14-year-old challenges. Um, I have uh, two other grandchildren, one on the way. And, and you know, the other thing that I just find so refreshing is just being at home with my husband. We have two couches in our living room. 
they face the fireplace and the big screen TV. And I am a homebody. COVID was not a problem for me. It just codified what I love to do anyway, which is to just be at home and still and at peace. Um, I'm, I am not a fan of people Oh, I'm just popping in. No, you know, th that all ended with COVID and that was fine with me. Um, you know, sometimes our dinner is peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or, or popcorn or, you know, whatever. Just, I, I'm easy. And I think my job, all the jobs I've had, but with the job now is just hard. It's demanding. Um, I get joy in my job when when agencies call me and say, "You're not going to believe this, but we just hired, you know, an equity, you know, advisor, or we just did this, or we have a plan." There's great joy in that during the day, um, but it's hard, and I want easy. At the end of the day, I want easy. <laughs> so, speaking of which, you all have given us so much of your time tonight. I've enjoyed every second of our of, of our conversation, but I want to give you easy. I want I want you to be able to, you know, take uh, a little breather at the end of your day. So, I think as we have no more questions from the audience, and um, we're going to wind down this conversation, um, and. I just wanna thank you both um, for giving not only your time, but your intelligence and your thoughtfulness um, in, in this uh, conversation. Um, and a big thank you to our digital team for helping us produce this program. And of course, a big, big, big thank you to our audience for sharing this experience with us. We wanna welcome you back for more programs on our social platforms. If you would like to support the Walters, you can go to um, this link that I think will appear on the screen. Okay, good. <laughs> For upcoming programming, including artist talks, curatorial lectures, performances, and more, please visit our website at thewalters.org. But before we wrap up, okay, before the last last thing I, you know, we always like to do is Zoe uh, first. Where can we see your work in person? Anywhere in, in the world? Is there somewhere we can see it now or anything upcoming that's exciting that you want to share with us? Oh, wow. Thanks for asking. Um, you can see an example of my work at the Phillips Collection. Um, they recently required, within the last year and a half, acquired a piece. So please go there. And um, of course, you are able to find my work, examples of my work online. And then also I am preparing, I am participating um, in a large group show that is co-hosted and sponsored by the Baltimore Museum of Art and the Mississippi Museum of Art called The Movement in, in Every Direction, the great, about the Great Migration. <laughs> and that will open in the spring of 2022. So please stay tuned. There are amazing artists in this group show and um, please definitely see it come to Mississippi. It opens up there first, but if not, it'll be in uh, at the BMA in the fall of 2022. Yay! <laughs> Another opportunity, because this is your second showing, right, at the BMA in the, in the recent past, in the recent uh, time. And Dana, is there anything that we should be looking out for in the city of Baltimore um, that we should be attuned to? Well, uh, we're going to be opening things up soon, so be looking for those announcements. Will be will be coming as as the state opens. We we will begin to open. Uh, for, in terms of equity initiatives, just you know, we'll be offering some uh, DEI training. People are asking for it, uh, not just for within the city, but for oh. those who do business with us and our partners. Uh, Y'all are asking for it. We're going to find a way. To deliver that and make it happen and really just expand our footprint and of uh, people that are keyed up and tuned in on DEI. And um, Keandra, I just want to say I am so impressed with you and all of the work that you put into this, bringing us together and curating our conversation. You really stretch me in my thinking and I just think you're phenomenal. <laughs> 
So thank you for, for inviting both of us. Um, Pleasure all mine, truly, truly, <laughs> truly. I know we say that, but truly, I just, I so enjoyed this. And um, if we could ever do something again, I will look out for the both of you and I'll be standing. Let's just say that I'll be standing. So <laughs> thank you both. Thank okay. you, Sandra. Thank you, Dana. Thank you so Have much. a beautiful night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.